church you may be dismissed for your class thank you servants wonderful worship i pray that that song oh this revelation right let's get into it right now i need my pulpit thank you ladies great job no you did a great job thank you so much just teasing you Well, praise the Lord. Do you have your Bibles? If you don't, there's one there in the pew in front of you. Page 714, last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1. Taking two looks at these verses, verses 7 and verses 8. As we look at the introduction to the message that Christ has to the seven churches of Asia Minor. 
which will begin in chapter 2. Let me read these verses, pray, and ask God to help us. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Father, I come to you and pray again, feeling weak in my body, needing the Spirit of God to not only help, me, but to help your people. All of us, Lord, we need to hear from you. Pray for your spirit to move in our hearts. Give give us ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to understand the truth. May this be a profitable time spiritually for all of us. We've come to worship you. You are worthy. You are the great I am. You know all things. And You know what we need right now. We are looking to you. As a deer panteth in the water, so our soul longs after you. May you feed us now and help us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we've been talking about the second second coming of Christ because we find these words in our study here as we're preparing ourselves to study the letters, the seven letters that Christ had given to the church, churches of Asia Minor. We find ourselves looking at these verses here in 7 and 8. Powerful subject, the second coming of Christ. There's so much material on the second coming of Christ. It's very important that we spend time thinking about it. There's nothing like studying the second coming of Christ to give us an awareness, at least an awareness, to create us to be a a people that are alert and thinking about the second coming of Christ. One of the things that we do as a church every month is we um, partake of the Lord's Supper, right? We have communion because it reminds us of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because if we just live our life and just do our normal things, we cannot always be thinking about the importance of what Christ has done for us on that cross. And even the study of the second coming reminds us that we need to be a people who are spiritually prepared for the second coming of Christ. I was reading an article and preaching today. Uh, You might be familiar with what took place a few years back. It's called Doomsday, False Alarm, Sparks, Panic, and Outrage. Outrage. On a balmy January Saturday morning, an alert warning of a nuclear doom was erroneous sent to millions of people across the state of Hawaii. Familiar with that in the news not too long ago. It said this, A ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Remember that? Those are the words that flashed on cell phones and television screens all across the state. It was a result of a mistake by an employee of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency who selected the wrong option in the text-based drop-down menu. You computer guys know what that's talking about, right? And so though the agency, it says, eventually issued a correction, residents and tourists as well as the Hawaiian natives tracking the impending disaster on the mainland in real time on social media, they were tracking it, criticized the government. Why? For taking 38 minutes, 38 minutes to issue a retraction to that warning. Can you imagine Living on that island 
And hearing that emergency and seeing it flash everywhere, that there's a nuclear missile coming toward your island and you're living on it, oh my goodness. Wow, that is a threat. And obviously it created a lot of anger in people, right? But it did it also not reveal that uh, people do crazy things and we have to get prepared for things like this. And it revealed, it says in July of 2017, confirmed that Hawaii was the first U.S. state with an attack warning system designed to detect nuclear threats. This latest development seemed to have shaken the public's trust. It's shaken the public's trust in its effectiveness. Threats. God doesn't make threats. You understand that, right? God doesn't threat people. He promises. He warns. Jesus is coming a second time. Could you imagine living on an island and knowing this threat is coming to you, a nuclear missile? And in, in, in a way, reminding us of the promise of God that Jesus is coming again. Almost like a missile, right? It's a warning from God. A promise for, for some of us, right? You're looking forward to it. A warning to others who are not really prepared and not living their life as though it's true and just kind of going on with life. It's coming. John says here in God's word, behold, he is coming. He is coming. Last two weeks ago, I spent some time talking about the necessity. There's a necessity of the second coming of Christ. Jesus must come again. I gave three reasons. There's actually nine that uh, scholars have pointed out to us. All of these reasons of the second coming of Christ are based on promises of God. Throughout the scriptures, God promises. He promised to Israel that a ruler would come who would, who would rule, rule over his people. And that hasn't happened yet. So the second coming of Christ demands that. He promised to his disciples. He says, I'm going to go I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And I, if I go to the, prepare a place for you, I will come again and bring you to myself. A promise, John 14. So the second, command, second, prom, second coming of Christ demands that it takes place. There's a promise that God gives to the church. If you look over at Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Because you have kept my commandment to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And, and so the promise to the church that he's going to keep us from that hour that's going to come upon this earth, the wrath of God. And so the demands that the second coming of Christ actually happens is a promise that God gives to rid the world of Satan and all the evil. Are you not glad that God gives that promise that we're not going to be battling Satan forever. Evil will not reign on this earth that we live in forever. And so the second coming of Christ is it's a promise from God. It demands that it actually happens. How about this? I'm not sure if you ever thought about this. The, the humility of Christ. Like Christ was humiliated. He was shamed. The king of kings and the Lord of lords humbled himself and came upon this earth and was not treated like a king. He was not treated like the son of God. He was rejected and hated by mankind. And so the second coming of Christ has to take place because he must come back as who he really is. He is the exalted one. He is king of kings and Lord of lords. And so the second coming of Christ must take place. It's demanded by God that it happens. How about this? The longing, and of, uh, the longing and of, er of every believer, the expectation that we have as followers of Christ, we're expecting him to come back. And are we not? All the promises of God, that look unto me, look, look. He's constantly saying, look. The second coming of Christ must take place. And so there's, an there's a necessity of the second coming of Christ that's so important. And so we must prepare our hearts and our lives for the second coming of Christ. It's just not information that God has given to us. It's a fact. 
we need to be prepared for it. And so there's necessity of the second coming of Christ. This text also reveals to us the nature of the second coming of Christ. It's going to be a real whew, glorious event. It's going to be a glorious event. He says, behold, he is coming with clouds. He is coming with clouds. This phrase, with clouds, is symbolic, and it speaks of the very presence of God. If you're familiar with your Bible, you will see throughout the Old Testament, God would lead his people throughout the wilderness, and the presence of God would guide them, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The very presence of God was, was guiding his people through the wilderness. When God gave his law upon Mount Sinai, uh, you could not see God himself because a cloud came down and covered the whole mountain and it shook with his presence and fear came upon all the people. It was an unbelievable, glorious manifestation of the Lord descending on that mountain. Clouds. Jesus, after he died, was buried and rose again. He ascended onto high, uh, up into heaven, and it says in Acts chapter 1, uh, clouds caused him to disappear. And then we made a promise in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 regarding believers who are going to be caught up to meet the, get, meet the Lord together uh, and to be with him forever in the clouds, to be with the Lord, presence of the Lord over and over again. For John, the writer of Revelation, he has in his heart and mind some Old Testament scriptures that are guiding his thought. And so many of the things that you'll see in Revelation come from Old Testament scriptures. And this one in particular, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, will be up on the screen for you. I'm sorry about my throat here. Listen to Daniel chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14, and see if you don't see exactly what John is talking about. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming, there it is, with clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. You see, the same language is being used here. The image is of one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds is the Messiah, and he is brought before the Ancient of Days, who is God the Father. And it looks like he comes with clouds again, right? And what is given to him is dominion and glory and the kingdom if you look back in Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 6. And he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's all the same language from Daniel chapter 7. And all the peoples are going to serve him. This is the same image that John sees. He sees Jesus coming with the clouds. Now, Jesus doesn't need clouds to ride, you understand? It's not, he's not riding on clouds as though he needs these clouds. I believe that these clouds are probably for our protection. They're for our protection because Jesus is the most glorious being on the un in the universe. And, and no one is able to see his glory. Even in Exodus chapter 33, when Moses wanted to see the glory of God, he could not see the glory of God because no one can see the glory of God and live. And so he was able to see the glory of God uh, covered. And it was not fully able to see that because God is a consuming fire. He is, uh, as the scripture says, he is an uh, inapproachable light. This is the Jesus that you and I worship. This is the Jesus that you and I ought to love. You see, this shows us something, that Jesus is not going to come again in humiliation. He will never be humiliated again. Jesus will come in glory, in honor. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Those knees that are bowing are both rich and, and poor. They're young and old. 
people are going to bow down. And those knees are connected. Those knees are connected to eyes that are going to see him. The scope of his coming. It says it's going to be an eye opener. Every eye will see him. John again is quoting from the Old Testament. And this time he's quoting from Zechariah. Who predicts a time of great grief and mourning. That will come upon the people of that day who are alive. Listen to Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. See if you can see the language that John is using here in Revelation 1. He says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And here it is. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn this will be a glorious, glorious event. The clouds are not meant to cover him, but they're meant to cover him to some degree to protect us from seeing the brilliance, the brilliance of the majestic one, Christ, the scope of his coming. It says that every eye is going to see him. This is not going to be an incognito event. Many Every eye, it says, is going to see him. If you're familiar with the scriptures and you're familiar with Christianity, you know that Jesus came the first time and he did not come in his glorious fashion. Only few saw him. He came in a lowly manner, um, born in a manger, born as a son of God with human parents, Joseph and Mary and he was admired by the shepherds and he was worshipped by the son of men. Mary, it says, pondered the things that were spoken of him. That was his first coming. And if you contrast that with his second coming, it will be a time of flash and dazzle. Things that the world was looking for. But listen. Listen. As every eye sees Jesus in this event, it's not going to be something that they're going to be happy to see to some extent. Because he's not coming to save, my friends. He's not coming as that lowly Savior. He's coming as a king, gloriously coming to judge the nations of the world. Every eye will see him. How shall we interpret that? Is it to be taken figuratively or literally? Well, I, I would say that John is interpreting the vision that he sees, but he's also interpreting what he reads from, from Zechariah and what he's reading from Daniel. And yes, every eye is going to see him. This is a promise. Every eye is going to see Jesus. All eyes will be on him. Meaning, listen, even those who have died, Yes, Jesus will be exalted in heaven and on earth, in hell and underneath. Every eye will see Jesus whom they have pierced. And as I was studying this, it caused me to worship him. It caused me to realize that Jesus actually deserves this. Jesus deserves to be exalted. Jesus deserves for every eye to see him as king of kings and lord of lords. And oh my goodness, just think about what it should do in your heart and mind right now. Your Jesus is not no longer this person who was beaten up and rejected by people. He's no longer looking like he's defeated. No, he is victorious. He is the king of kings. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you too stand. You are victorious. You are in the family of God and you, re you will reign with him forever and ever. He will defeat every enemy that is against God. And if you are for him, you are going to reign with him as well. Amen. What a wonderful, glorious event. Every eye is going to see him. Woo! Glory. 
It gets me excited. I hope it gets you excited, too. And I know we have some skeptics out there. You know, how in the world can you interpret this to be literal, every eye see in him? Right? There might be some of you here today. Well, listen, you know if you're a computer guy, you would say, hey, with today's technology, kinds of things would be, it's possible, right? You know, we got some smart people on this earth, do we not, who, who have done things with computers and, you know, they can do fancy things. We got some smart people out there. Don't let your smartness get to your head, though, because everything you and I see out there, this beautiful creation that God created, God spoke that with one word. And if God can speak this creation into existence with a word, this technology that you, you and I see is not even near technology that Jesus himself can probably create in a heartbeat because he is all-knowing and all-powerful. He probably has technology that this world has never seen. He's well, well far advanced than any person on this earth. And so, yeah, I do believe I do believe it's possible that every eye is going to see him because I believe he deserves that. Amen? He deserves it. Now, it says here, it lists two different groups of people who will actually see him. The scope of his coming involves two groups of people mentioned here. Look at your text here. Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. Two groups of people, those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth. I think those are two different groups of people. I believe he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Jews, even they who pierced him. This, obviously, the Roman soldier pierced Jesus in the side. It's probably including that, right? Right? But I believe that this is speaking this, of this rejection that came from the Jewish people who he came unto his own, but his own received him not. And he's pierced. Jesus was a, a savior, wounded, pierced for our iniquity. And so that rejection, even they who pierced him, speaking of the Jewish people. But Jesus is not coming to save. He's coming to bring reckoning. He's coming to bring justice on this earth. And so this is not going to be an event that's going to cause some kind of a amusement. No. There will be a response to this coming that has been avoided by every rebellious sinner on the earth. All those who love themselves and their sin will be dreading this coming of the Lord. The scope of his return not only reaches those who rejected him within the Jewish people, but it says all the tribes of the earth, look at the language, will mourn because of him. This speaks of the response that comes from the Gentile world. The response, John says, will be a mourning. And so if you study this, the mourning is a mourning of repentance. There is going to be repentance that comes during the tribulation period. Uh, there will be many Jewish people during the tribulation period who will turn to the Lord. A national repentance will take place. The scriptures say that all of Israel shall be saved, right? There's going to be a fountain that's opened up, a pouring out of grace and supplication upon God's people. So many Jewish people are going to repent and turn to the Lord. But not every single individual Jewish person, that would not be true, which is not speaking of universal cleansing. But there will be a remnant chosen by God who will repent, as Zechariah says, a spirit of grace will fall upon his people. Many. But it also speaks of some of the Gentiles who, re who will repent. Uh, there will be some from every tribe, tongue, and nation around the throne of God, Jews and Gentiles, worshiping the Lord. And you are included in that number. There will be a repentance, a mourning. But this word mourning is not used just primarily for repentance. It is used for the mourning of, or a sorrow for judgment. Many, many 
are going to hate his appearing. Even during the tribulation period. That is, that'd be true even now. Talk about God, talk about Jesus with somebody, and it's almost like they, they don't know him, but they hate him already. Talk about spiritual things, and people get uncomfortable, right? You see it if you talk about Christ with anybody. Maybe in your own home, you bring up the Lord, and it's uncomfortable. There are people who actually hate God now, hate Jesus now, and they will hate his appearing. They will mourn because they will be judged by God. They will be in extreme grief and even terror that will come upon this world because the party's over. The party is over. And there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. And all those who rejected him will be judged. And he says, even so, amen. Amen. And then he gives, Jesus gives his signature as a way to bring certainty to this event. And so look at verse 8. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. If you know anything about uh, Greek language, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And so he's saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I have all knowledge. The letters of the alphabet, I know them all. And all the knowledge that is in the world, I have all knowledge. And then I'm the beginning and I'm in the end. I'm eternal. So I have eternal knowledge. I know everything. So I'm telling you, for certainty, this will take place. Behold, he is coming. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, the Sovereign One. Who is, right? Present God. Who was presently, he still is God, and who is to come. He is always in control, and he brings certainty to what he is promising. And so with all that being said, brothers and sisters and friends, the second coming of Christ ought to produce something in your life right now. As you hear these words, some of you are excited about it, and you're looking forward to the coming of the Lord, right? So the, the message of the second coming of Christ produces something in your life. You're not dead yet, right? And so it's producing something in your life. Put away the gadgets and think about the second coming of Christ. It's coming. Christ is coming. And so what do you do with these words? What do these words produce in your life? How do these words, behold, he is coming, make you feel? Do you think, oh, Ah, he hasn't come yet. Why would he come now? And you live a life of unbelief. There's nothing rattling your cage at all. You just live your life and you don't give any thought to these things because you love your sin and you're living in it and you're not a believer. You haven't made faith personal yet. It's parents' faith or, or you're just, maybe you're just hoping that it's not true. Behold, he is coming. God has never lied. He's never lied, not once. His words, all of his words are true. If you're here this morning and that's your condition of your heart, that it doesn't, doesn't move you, I pray for you that you would repent and right now you would sense that the Holy Spirit is calling you and convicting you of your sin and your need of a Savior, and that you would turn from your sins. You might not have tomorrow. Today could be the last day. That's why it's important to think of these things. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so if you've come this morning, whether you're visiting or you come every Sunday, and you're not sure if you die right now, you'll be in heaven, please, please know that he is coming not to save you, He's giving you that chance now. Today is a day of salvation. Turn from your sins and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Perhaps today as you're hearing these words, the promise of his coming produces in you some 
form of a disappointment. Uh, you are a child of God, but you've got plans of your own, right? You know, if you're young, you want to get that job you've been looking for, or you want to get that into that relationship that you've been looking forward to having and having a significant other, or you've been working really hard at that job that you're at, and, and no matter how old you are, you want to get that promotion, and you wanna, or if you want to see your kids grow up and, and serve the Lord, you know, I have that longing in my heart too, and I want grandchildren, but I hope I never get to the place where I want those things more than I long for the coming of Christ. That would mean that my heart is in the wrong place and I desire the things of this earth, right? I love the things of this earth more than I love the promises that I've got a better thing coming, amen? And I need to take these words to heart. And so I pray that we would let the truth of the second coming do something in our life. And I want to end with with a hope that it will encourage you. I want to encourage you. Because the second coming of Christ reminds us of the world that we live in. Uh, we live in a fallen world, do we not? We live in a fallen world. We live presently in a world that we experience pain, right? Suffering, the battles that we have with sin, the world, our sinful nature, producing wrong thinking in our mind. And the second coming of Christ reminds us. We hear the message this morning, reminds us that Jesus is coming back again, and that there's something better that he has for you and for me. God has a plan, and this plan is for us, not not against us. And when he comes, he will put an end to all of those struggles, to all of those pains, to all of those things that we are battling with. We as believers, this is our greatest hope, is it not? That we long and expect this, the promise of his coming. It ought to fill all of our hearts with a great Hope, a living hope, the scriptures talk about. But what do we do in the meantime as we wait, right? What do we do? We live in this, it's called a gap between the first coming and the second coming. Gap of history. We're living in that gap. And what do we do? Well, we need to live. Can't stop living, right? What do we do? Well, we should live in this gap with the struggles that we're going through with a certain mindset. Came across this article and it reminded me of this gap. It talks about the gap. If you've ever been to London and you ride in their subway system, you've heard something over the loudspeakers over and over again. In the London subway system, there is a constant reminder to pay attention to the gap. There is a gap between the platform and the opening of those subway doors. If you're small enough, you might fall down, right? And so there's a constant reminder. It's flashing everywhere. And this over the loudspeaker, constantly saying, mind the gap. Mind the gap. It's unbelievable. I have been there just reading about it here. It's quite a scene. So if, I don't know, anybody here can raise their hand. They've actually experienced that. Nobody's been to the subway, London subway system. No one at all. Joe? Okay. One person. I feel better now. Okay. But it's a constant reminder to mind the gap. And so that reminds us of our life as well because we live in a life that we have to mind the gap because there's pitfalls in our life as well. And so how do you mind the gaps of life between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ? Do you simply stare at the gap, debating how you might leap across it or not? Do you simply look down at your two feet? Kind of, what do you do? Well, look up. That's what we should do. Look up instead to the one who entered history, who walked amidst the countless chasms of this fallen and bruised world. Look to the one who ultimately overcame the gaps that we, you and I struggle with and all the problems that we're going through, who was life, death, burial, and resurrection. And so, Christian, look up. Look up, not just with your eyes with your affections, your heart. Look up. Colossians chapter 3 tells us, verses 1 through 4, how to look up. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. 
seek those things which are above, where Christ is. He is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on things above. Not just your mind, but your affections. Set them above, not on things of the earth. And then he, he connects this with the second coming of Christ. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In the context here in Colossians chapter 3, if you just leave it up there, Mark, talks about putting to death the members of our sinful nature and things that we're struggling with. But we, in other words, we don't just wait and do nothing to set our mind on things above, to look up and to mind the gap that we're living in. Because we don't just sit around and do nothing and just come to church. We need to actively put to death the things that we're struggling with. We need to pursue, or as Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The context in there in Matthew chapter 6. How do we seek? How do we go back to Colossians? How do you set your mind? We don't just sit by and do nothing. And in Ma Matthew, Jesus is saying, how do, we set, how do we seek the kingdom of God? Well, stop worrying about your life. Stop worrying about tomorrow. God got it. Does he got it or not? He has it. Everything's under control. Talks about our treasures, right? Set wherever your treasure is, there your heart is as well. These are all what God is telling us, to how we are to seek the kingdom of God, how we are to set our minds on things above. It's not just we sit by idly waiting and hoping that his coming takes place. We are to actively pursue a certain kind of lifestyle. I want to end with 2 Peter chapter 3. These verses are so clear. Verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all all these things will be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for, there it is, and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You're going to make me go to my Bible, Mark? Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, he says, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Verse 17, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. You see, it's not telling us to sit by and do nothing. There ought to be a pursuit in our, on our behalf, pursuing the things of God, not just idly sitting by, God wants us to be found blameless, wants us to be seen by him, pursuing him. And that, that's not meaning that we just stop doing bad things. It's right here, brothers and sisters. You can try to change all the external things that are going wrong in your life, all the struggles that are around you. It won't change the thing until your heart changes. It's got to happen in the heart. And I pray for that, for my life, for your life, that we will become a people that when he says watch and pray so you know not when that hour or day comes, he actually finds us watching and praying because in our heart we'd rather be with him than be here. We'd rather be 
closer to Jesus than have all the treasures that this earth, this earth offers to you and I. May that be true in all of our hearts. And so I'm going to close in a word of prayer. And as I'm praying, if God has spoken to your heart and you say, you know, man, I, I don't really desire the things of God as I ought to. This, this world has a greater hold on my life than it ought to. Well, what, everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And will you talk to God in your own words? Turn from that sin that is holding you back. There's a next step that God wants you to take. The second coming of Christ produces something in your life right now. May it not make you more calloused, but may it make you more concerned spiritually for your life. Concerned enough that you would take that next step and say, I need my heart needs to change. I need to turn from the things that I'm loving more than I love. And I pray, God, you would change my heart. I've not been obedient to you. I should get baptized. I've not been obedient to you. I should join the church. I've not been obedient to you. I should be a better husband, be a better father, be, be a better wife, a better mother. I've not been obedient to you. I'm not serving in the church as I ought to. I'm not being obedient to you. I'm not growing in the grace and knowledge. I'm pursuing, it could be something good, but you're not pursuing the Lord. You're not digging into his word, discovering the treasure that's in it, the Jesus that's longing to be the greatest treasure of your life. But you don't read about him enough. You don't study him. You don't meditate upon him. You ought to be discipled, but you're not seeking that. Behold, he is coming. This morning, God, I pray that you would have your way in someone's heart today. We wouldn't just be hearers of your word. We'd be doers of it. May you have your way in every heart. Thank you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Why don't we stand and sing this song of invitation, song of response, invitation. God has spoken to your heart. and You need counsel today. You want to talk to someone. You want to pray with somebody. Or you just want to pray on your own. Come slide out of your pew. May God work in your heart. You slide out. You come down here and pray. You want to talk? You need counsel? Grab my hand and say, I need Jesus. I need to talk to someone. We'll get you the help you need. Let's sing unto the Lord.